Okay, so basically what interests me in this talk today is when we think of photography and the technology in photography and um, the different processes that are behind uh, this technology, how does it actually influence the physical production of things? And I would like to show an example that just came across um, uh, uh, my kind of everyday reading last week when uh, there was a lot of coverage on Georg Baselitz's 80th birthday. He's one of the most famous painters uh, of the 20th century. And um, there's a work that I haven't seen of his, uh, which I would like to share today. So this one, uh, in his famous of paintings that are upside down, he questions kind of the, the, uh, the mostly the German society, everything after Second World War, how we are kind of losing ground, how we are floating somehow in uncertainty, how certain values are put upside down. That's what his famous signature is like. So he paints upside down. Um, this is his ex-wife, um, Elke, or wife, I don't know if they're still married. Um, he's 80 now. And Elke, as you can see here, is upside down. When you see it in an exhibition, this is another painting of his, it's interesting that you look at it as an artistic expression. But what I didn't know is that once, actually, you put this photo in word, um, you see it in the real colors. So somehow the technology and the negative of the positive became somehow the physical production. Again, this is Elke in the negative way to look at it. Um, and here is Baselitz in front of his painting. On the left side, it's him with the negative painting, and on the right side, it's the negative of um, that photo, and it turns into what we actually imagine is the physical, real reproduction of Elke. So in a way, the thinking of, or in the knowledge of certain technologies also makes us rethink the idea how we position our body in take technology as part of that production and to twist perception and understanding of reality. I would like to show two projects. One is XXX, Triple X, um, Times Square with Love, that we um, installed about one and a half years ago in New York on Times Square. And the other one will be Metropole Parasol in Seville, both public spaces that deal very much how we use public spaces, how we want to explore different angles and viewpoints in public spaces with other people to celebrate a certain community. So Triple X, um, what you see here is bringing people in a different position to look at public space in a different way. And triple X are three lounge furniture pieces that allow four or more people to sit or lay down and start to negotiate like who can stretch out their feet, who can like maybe snuggle next to somebody else, um, how you actually down and relax. And of course it has a very specific geometry that comes from the location Times Square as being the intersection of Broadway and 7th Avenue. Um, and here you see a simulation how, how we thought they would be placed on um, Broadway. But also the view then of course how it's sitting on the ground, how you can look down on it is of course an important issue. There is maybe no other safer place on earth where you can have a nap because it's next to the rec recruitment pavilion where the American military you know, informs and you know, tries to con convince people to join the military. And there are always you know, people with machine guns standing around. But there's also a certain history that um, Times Square forgot to kind of mention or keep in, in its um, certain um, ambiguity and atmosphere of the place, which is the seedy, you know, kind of erotic history of 42nd Street and Times Square. And when Times Square Arts Alliance, um, who is running the arts program on Times Square, saw our proposal and asked us to, you know, um, contribute something to the arts program there, they really loved it because Times Square, you know, organization gets accused so often of you know, making it a slick, shopping environment without really keeping the historic levels, the history, le the, the level, the, the layers of history um, as, a, as a conscious uh, part of the experience of, um, t of that area. So the triple X came as a, a, a kind of a device where you could lay down and enjoy the space in a different way. There are 20 or even more webcams that are installed all around the Times Square buildings that look down onto um, the intersection in the public spaces. And that's what we wanted to create a dialogue between you laying down, looking up into the sky, which you see on the uh, lower right side. At the same time, there are all these webcams that are looking down on you. So there is a certain 
let's say, interconnectivity where you know once you're laying down or you walk on Times Square, you actually project it into the world. It's not just you and the space, but it's you and the world. At the same time, it might give a chance to log in to these webcams. You create an image and you kind of prove that you have been there. You send it to your friends. You send it out um, back into social media. And we heard this uh, today already about social media as being uh, a different form of photography. There is, of course, let's say, the serious uh, photography as art or as documentary, but there's also a certain everydayness of photography that is becoming such a powerful tool now. And so this one somehow addresses this powerful tool of photography that everybody you know, uses so uh, frequently now. We also wanted it to be interconnected to a social media and we created a Snapchat filter um, that is explained here and we projected a couple of images where uh, we thought this could be a way how you communicate your being on Times Square, um, anchoring yourself to the history of the Times Square and then also bring it back. If Times Square is not able of actually creating a lot of media coverage, who else um, would be better than that? So the evening of Times Square opening of the Triple X, um, it was projected um, and covered in the taxi TVs on, in New York. So this is actually when I drove home, randomly that came on in a loop, which was fantastic. But also two weeks later, even that image of the launching on Times Square became somehow the photography or let's say the, um, the argument um, discussing the growing real estate market around Times Square area. So very small, simple, you know, elements completely start to rethink and reposition yourself and uh, kind of us within the public space. So this is how it's used and it's much more crowded during the nights than the day. Um, it's really bright of, because of all the um, LED walls around it. And um, just in December, it was declared as one of the 10 places that redefine or define New York City in a different way. So you can see even small interventions really change the way we look at one of the most powerful, maybe, intersections in the world. Um, from here, I would like to just jump through a couple of projects that have similar qualities and similar, let's say, resonances, um, but I wanted to, to explore a little bit the variety um, that we create with our buildings before I jump into Metro Parcel and show how that somehow anchored the after image um, in the production. So this is a dining hall in Karlsruhe, Germany, or um, a rest stop in Georgia. Here, for example, uh, couples, because they have some restaurants in there, um, once they were uh, installed, uh, they were already requested to have the wedding ceremonies in the restaurants of the, um, of the rest stops. So you can imagine how much it actually contributes and how much it creates a certain desire for different spaces in that um, part of the world. <coughs> this is a university building in Berlin in infra light concrete. So this will be just one thick concrete wall without any insulation because that's part of that very light concrete already. Uh, same university we built a building for in Düsseldorf that's finished last year. Um, a courthouse in Belgium in Hasselt where the tree, Hasselt comes from hazelnut tree which is kind of the logo of the, um, of the town becomes an abstracted version for the building where justice is spoken. Uh, office building in Hamburg on the waterfront, or a housing project in Berlin. A parking garage facade to be opened in April in Miami. This is a collage project. It was called Collage Garage in the beginning. Now it's Museum Garage because there are museums around it now. But you have five architects, work AC, us, Nicola Biff, Manuel um, Clavel, and um, Terry Riley, who is the curator of this collage concept. Um, all that was a completely different, interesting way to think of uh, wrapping a building in different agendas. Um, a border checkpoint in Georgia, between Georgia and Turkey on the Black Sea. Um, a high rise in Düsseldorf, where we are on the fourth floor now in construction, and um, a sculpture also in Georgia on the Black Sea to mark the beginning of a new town. And the last one in this little panoramic overview is a temporary pavilion in timber, uh, which was then reused afterwards for the city celebration of 300 years of Karlsruhe. So all of that are buildings that kind of activate public space or have a certain relationship of the public um, being kind of redefined and reanimated through architecture. And uh, one of the, let's say, most extreme projects in that way in our portfolio is um, Metropole Parasol in Seville. 
And these are images that we contributed in the first phase of the competition. And I wanted to show you how even during the competition, we const constantly readjusted our view um, how we imagine the building to be afterwards, which is not a stable projection, but it's something that is an, a massaged um, kind of construction of an image that um, it develops over time, uh, develops with more knowledge, develops with more consultants and inputs like engineers or construction companies. So the first um, concept we developed was this perforated cloud sitting on a platform which was the food market that the city wanted. <coughs> This was for the first phase, which was anonymous, and we got selected. Here you see the other image. Um, in the second phase, we had to become much more serious and uh, in a way how we can construct it and then brought in Arab engineers to help us to think about how these parasols and these mushrooms could be built. This was then for the second final competition phase, how we imagined it. I was not so happy because I didn't like the construction and kind of coverage being separated as two elements. I still saw it as one homogeneous materiality, but this is what we could achieve at that phase with um, the engineers. Then we won the competition and we started to think of how this pattern or how this, um, yeah, this, this, this skin could become a structural entity, which you see here some studies. It became so complicated um, with the size, which is 150 meters long, 75 meters wide, and about 30 meters high, that um, we had to give it up because in 2004 there were no computers who were able to actually calculate something like this. At the same time also there was a certain frustration to me because if you wrap it with one kind of skin uh, system, it actually looks the same everywhere. It looks the same where it becomes horizontal, it, it looks the same where it becomes vertical. So, and we had to also find a way to make it somehow um, producible. So then the next step was how if we don't build a skin, uh, but instead build the interior, which is somehow this lattice work that you see here, uh, we can use the invisible skin as the one that cuts the built grid versus the unbuilt grid that is kind of a, an invisible, endless uh, structure. And this is how we kind of step slowly, slowly towards the version how we built it. So finally, the structure that we chose is this one here, and you can see how this endless grid south, west, uh, south, north, north, south, east, west um, is captured within that invisible shape, that skin that you saw in the beginning, but now we are building the inside volume and not the skin in itself. So it stays kind of an open um, elastic envelope because we had to adjust it in the process due to structural com um, uh, discoveries where it had to be higher for larger spans, where it had to be reduced for less weight for the ground, and therefore it became a negotiation between these different um, forces at work. Landmark department wanted it to be lower here. Um, some, I don't know, uh, consultancy who thought that it would be important to have an overview of the city wanted to be higher here. So it was a constant negotiation and remodeling of that proposal. <coughs> so these were these images where we felt we could communicate how you can walk up there, how it's becoming a promenade, um, how it relates to the city, and this is then the build version. So that after image that we created, after it was built, was also what guided, guided us all the way through the decision making um, in putting this project into reality. So this is the view that you see where the building is just a little higher than the horizon line that might have just um, explained. It's a little higher than the skyline, but not too much um, to really interfere with the skyline of Seville. You also don't really see it from further away because it's built into this very tight pocket of, um, of, of buildings around it. Uh, so it's more of a discovery once you get closer and the small street opens up, you're underneath this um, umbrella. So it sits in the very center of the city of Seville at the uh, core or the heart of this X-shaped largest medieval town center um, in Europe, as I was told. And it becomes one of these larger institutions in this extremely dense fabric. So you see it at the bottom here sitting on Plaza de la Encarnacion, but you see also on a, um, at the top of the building the cathedral, on the right side the bullfight ring. So you have these larger buildings put into um, this dense fabric. Metropole parasol is a structure that has a couple of layers where you have the ground 
uh, the underground, which is a discovery into the history of um, Seville. You have the ground floor as the food market, uh, and an elevated roof of the food market as an elevated plaza, and then the parasols with the skywalk and also some rooms and function rooms that you can rent on the top. You see also that it sits at the very heart of the city and it really redefines the image that the city creates. And this was also part of the goal, what um, the competition wanted to achieve. <coughs> Sorry. Um, there is somehow the hope that the lower part of the egg-shaped medieval town, uh, which was very well developed, you had um, you know, the cathedral, the castle, the park, the bullfight arena, and oh, thank you, the, um, the town hall. Um, all of that was uh, in a very well functioning during the time of the competition. The north part was a little shady, was a little dangerous. Um, and so the city wanted to create this pro that project to improve um, the quality of the northern half and kind of bridge that development. So very local, uh, local um, importance. The national importance was that Sevilla wanted to compete with other Spanish cities who all showed their competence and innovation like Valencia or Barcelona. And internationally to really prove that Seville is a place of innovation, becomes even more a tourist destination, a place to invest that um, industry and um, innovation companies would um, consider Seville as a place. So uh, it all worked very well. Um, the competition started when this was the site, uh, the condition at the beginning of the competition, where the city actually wanted to build a parking garage. Um, the northern part of the plaza was digged out, the walls all the way down into the ground. And then by digging out the ground, they found all these Roman ruins and these beautiful mosaics. And that's when the, competition, uh, the construction stopped. And the city had the chance to ask, how do we use this window into the history of our city? How can we keep it? Um, because nowhere else you can really have such a large piece of land at the very kind of found, uh, foundation of uh, or the beginning of the city of Seville. So the competition basically asked for how to redefine urban space in the 21st century. This was the market who was at that place before. The lower part was taken down in the 50s to create the end point of a bus stop. Um, and the northern part was taken down in the 70s. So it was um, an empty parking spot for 30 years, a gravel um, land <laughs> um, at the very heart of the city and not really productive for urban life. When we thought about what we could do on this competition, Shadow was the very first tool because I remember when I was in Seville in 92 for the World Expo, it was really hot and you know, similar to your um, country here, Shadow is a very important factor for you know, making spaces uh, enjoyable during um, summer and during the hot times of the year. <coughs> So these are some inspirations that we found uh, in the neighborhood of our site. These are two trees on Plaza de la uh, Jesus Borges. Um, this is the um, uh, undulated stone roof of the cathedral. And this is inside the cathedral where the structure really becomes the space defining element. And again here you see the layering of the underground, the uh, ground floor food market and some restaurants, the elevated plaza, the parasols and the skywalk on the top. What is also important when you project somehow this after image, like what is the performance of that building in terms of its sustainability? So this was one that was important. How can we achieve certain knowledges um, and discoveries that can be also transferred to other projects? So um, for example, <coughs> what are the, uh, the discoveries in its um, construction? What are the social impacts and so forth? What, are, you know, what does it do to society around it? Will it affect the uh, rent market around that area? How are the shops doing afterwards? Um, is the economy doing better? What is the relationship between the visitors and tourists and the locals um, and so forth? So all these aspects are really important um, to make kind of sensitive decisions when you do something like this. So the division between the northern part, which was the poorer part and the south, the southern part, how can that be um, overcome? Also, what are the ecological, let's say, sustainable aspects of it when it comes to shadows, um, climate control, activation of solar energy, structural knowledge and structural ele um, elegance uh, built into this thing? Um, how can it be built uh, so it's feasible and um, uh, you can pay for it? At the same time, how does it actually generate more business for the whole city of Seville? Um, certain 
let's say, strategies how to make that organic shape happen, you know, to control the, the calculations. To calculate that roof at that time took about three weeks to actually run it through the whole project. And once maybe the direction of the wood fibers is wrong, this is all a wood structure, then they would have to do it another three weeks. So it's really um, a very careful process. At the same time, what is it creating in terms of souvenirs, in terms of like takeaways, how um, does it kind of spread through smaller scales? And then of course, how much is it maybe a new aesthetic that talks of um, our every of our current time and how does it become a proof and witness um, of the kind of the discoveries that we make now towards the future so when you go back on the side this is um, the archaeology site on the ground floor um, here you see the sections and everything that's beige on the lower part here is this timber construction everything that's darker brown or gray <coughs> is either concrete or steel. So we had to take some parts in concrete because of earthquake issues and fire um, considerations. But basically what you see, what is the most iconic of Metropole Parasol is that gridded um, organic timber construction. It makes a lot of sense when you're there because then you see it really in contrast to the existing old buildings. And these are just some images of how it stands there. Um, right after it was finished. You see the grid of the shadow. This was actually the first idea that we had um, to make it even that an, an animated new surface. And in the dialogue between the existing building and the new structure. The view, once you get up um, above the horizon of the city, and here you see again the history of the city, and it was or the, it is an important city because it really modernized Europe um, through Islamic um, mathematics and other you know, sciences that were brought into our European culture and therefore that's why Sevilla is so important for our culture. So our anchor into history was not echoing historic styles or aesthetics but echoing the innovation capacity of the city. And here one night view once you're up there. So once it arrived, um, and this is actually what we hoped to achieve with it, and you saw some of the, let's say, simulations and aspirations of, uh, in the design process, are now how it really arrived in a city. So the city in their own city marketing uses it as a very um, kind of flashy picture. Um, Sevilla has the Semana Santa, which is the religious week with processions the week before Easter. Those were the ones who were most against our project. They thought we would ruin you know, the old hundreds of years of tradition of these processions. Well, the next year after it was inaugurated, it was even the cover of their um, schedule for Semana Santa. So even for the kind of activation and the liveliness of the procession, it was a very you know, successful um, tour. This was around Christmas when it became part of the crib. <coughs> uh, even schools are building these um, cribs now. Um, this is a picture from a boy uh, from a civil school. And these are the processions that you can see here. Again, photography, everyday photography, very important factor. How to communicate being on site, proving I was there to other people. This is mostly maybe what we do with photography today. Um, again, processions, uh, and you can see how well it works now with all these you know, uh, rituals that are 100 years old with this new image. And this is, I think, a very powerful view how these floats are going through Metropole Power Zone. There's also flamenco festivals and um, a lot of music videos that I found online. Very juicy, um, kind of cheesy uh, Latino pop. It also works for hip hop. Uh, it works for more Latino pop that you can see here. But it also works for Bollywood. Do you know them? <laughs> it's actually a very seductive song. You have to look it up. Um, or for Swiss um, chanson. Miss Spain wanted to become Miss Universe, so she got photographed on Metropole Parasol. It did not work. Um, New Balance felt inspired for their souls. Um, of course, there is television, um, Eurogames, coverage, public viewing. <coughs> Car companies seems to like it. Um, Mercedes-Benz kind of rebuilt the structure and animated it with a totally like wrong uh, floor, but also the building in the back is not ours. But BMW liked it. Also, Jeep liked it, Volkswagen liked it a lot, and even now Renault likes it this year. 
So um, it becomes really a powerful tool also for economy and the market around it goes up to, we know what gentrification does, but I think in this case it also helped really to make the city a safe uh, and lively place again. Um, Red Bull had it as part of the Red Bull challenge. Um, Gay Pride um, was p taking part there, but the comic festival on the other hand also used it as a kind of a sign for invasion. It then turned into a fashion production um, here and street painting as well. This is what I got from a friend from India. It was part of an Indian sports television show. Um, so there are little offsprings that are making it around. And of course, there is um, a lot of political demonstrations in Spain that seem to concentrate under Metro Parasol for all kinds of reasons. Uh, in 2011, when the project actually got iterated already m more or less seven years ago, it has uh, founded a new political party called Podemos. It was the place where people were discussing about the future of their culture. Um, here you see the, uh, the new party discussing. They even used Metropole Parasol as their logo. And um, it was the moment where it really became the place for discussion, for sit-ins, for organization. In this case, even inverting the phrase form follows function into actually form a function, no, form places function. So each of these like six stems of the parasol, one became the kitchen, uh, one became the Wi-Fi area, one became kind of the signing up for the different workshops. So it was kind of interesting how that whole demonstration week or month um, started to group around the spatial discoveries here. And it was also the time when people were allowed to sleep there because it's exhausting to talk about the future. Um, and this is what uh, usually a night view looks like. But again, also, it was very satisfying to see that this kind of doubt if a project like this could really work in a historic context. And if this is really something that makes sense and, you know, goes into the heart of the people who live there, but also radiates um, internationally. Um, it became the cover of uh, Lonely Planet a couple of years ago. And last year in December, it actually was named the best place to travel in 2018. So you can see how creating an image and constructing a kind of a, a, a new identity for a place with an architecture that seems to be daring at the same time has all the emotional factors built in um, is rewarding. And of course, it all is based on the decision making of the city in Seville and the mayor who was in place then. Um, it's an accomplice that you need as an architect. At the same time, the client needs the architects. It's a very fruitful dialogue. And I hope um, it kind of encourages all of us to always push to something that is unknown, but we have to know how to imagine that after you that we want to create with the preview that seems to seduce us into these projects. Thank you so much.